our moderator mr mustafizur rahman khan barrister at law and advocate to supreme court of bangladesh who has been with us since the beginning of the lecture series and who has enlightened us and has been a great support to us to this endeavor along with a number of uh, honorable judges of the supreme court as well and i would in specially like to thank mr justice iman ali who is one of the uh, who i we would say that think legal is the brain child of in a way and mr justice said refat ahmed who supported us with the first lecture who we, who which actually took things off the ground for us without further ado i would like to um, welcome also mr honorable mr justice anaitur rahim who has just arrived uh, without further ado i would like to welcome on, uh, on to the podium mr mustafizur rahman khan thank you my lords ladies and gentlemen it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the ninth lecture of the think legal lecture series uh, Sakib has already uh, spoken about the background of Think Legal, and uh, since time is of the essence, and we are already running a late. No thanks to me in particular, because I myself have been held up in traffic. Uh, I would not repeat anything that Sakib has said. Let me just then begin by introducing uh, the today's speaker, Mr. Justice Obaidul Hassan is. one of the distinguished judges of the supreme court of bangladesh presently serving in the high court division uh, before his elevation it was preceded by a very distinguished legal career which saw him serve first of all as the assistant attorney general and then as the deputy attorney general of bangladesh during his legal career mr justice obaidul hassan has had the opportunity to work along with luminaries in our legal fraternity Uh, Mr. Justice Muhammad Abdul Wahab Mia, uh, Mr. Uh, Reza Rahman, when he was in the Attorney General's office, he worked with Mr. Late Mr. Mahmudul Islam, and uh, also with our present learned Attorney General, Mr. Mahbub Alam. And this experience of his is amply reflected with the fortitude, with the uh, wisdom with which he has been discharging his functions as a judge since his elevation in 2009. uh following his elevation he was also faced with a very unique challenge uh i do not have to recount the background through which bangladesh was born bangladesh was born after a historic struggle for liberation which culminated in the war of independence uh which we fought following the clarion call of the father of the nation bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman during the course of the war we lost 3 million of our brothers and sisters lost their lives many women lost their honor and it is following the it is the, in this very bloody backdrop that bangladesh emerged as an independent nation during the war of independence various war crimes were committed atrocities were committed crimes against humanity were committed and with a view to bring those who are responsible for such crimes in 1973 the Inter International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973 was enacted however because of a lack of political commitment on the part of successive government this tribunal did not came to function until 2009 when the present government was elected when this present government was elected the tribunal actually started its work and we have already seen the fruits of this tribunal's work because those who were responsible for committing atrocities for committing crimes against humanity for committing war crimes they have been brought to justice and in this process mr justice obadul hasan has had a significant role because he was a judge of one of the tribunals he had chaired one of the tribunals in a particular context i also had the privilege of appearing before him so and during my own personal experience i have seen the fortitude with the wisdom with which he has discharged his judicial responsibilities uh, war crimes are different than ordinary criminal trials in the sense that the ordinary principles of criminal jurisprudence with which we are familiar both as far as substantial criminal law is concerned as well as the procedure 
in which criminal trials are conducted. These are not typically followed in war crimes trial. Because of the very nature of the crime, the uh, evidence is not available in a very convenient way. Particularly in the context of our experience, the trials were happening uh, a good 40 years after the event. So that made the task all the more challenging, both for the prosecution as well as the judges themselves. And yet we have seen the tribunal accomplish its primary goal and still continuing to uh, perform uh, its, in its function. And this is something with which the younger lawyers who are here before us, they can benefit from the wisdom of Mr. Justice Ubaidul Hassan. Uh, the experiences, the challenges that he has faced with these will be very important learning tools for us. And uh, above all, you must remember that, uh, as I said, war crimes are different from ordinary crimes. Typical, the typical uh, legal concepts that we associate with criminal trials, these are generally not applied in the course of uh, trying war crimes. You must also remember that uh, apart from the very important function of uh, bringing to justice those who have committed these atrocities, the purpose of uh, war crime trials, whether it be in Bangladesh or historically wherever it has happened, starting with Nuremberg, also in Yugoslavia, in Rwanda, in Cambodia, the purpose of this exercise is to bring closure over a particular traumatic episode in the history of a nation so that the nation can move on. And in that sense, Mr. Justice Obadul Hassan has served Bangladesh brilliantly, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to you. And without further ado, may I request Mr. Justice Obadul Hassan to come up to the stage and to take the dais and deliver his lecture. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Very good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not that good at English. The horrible, I, I speak in a very horrible English. I don't know English as good as star moderator Mustafa Rahman Khan. Star. Yes, you have been addressed as star moderator. <laughs> star moderator. And other, uh, other distinguished guests present here who have studied in USA and England, UK, and other countries. We have studied in Dhaka University. The very ordinary teachers have taught us. So we are not that good at English. And judges, I believe, judges, after taking oath, it is difficult for them to give any public speech. Public speech, sometimes, it becomes embarrassment for the judges. And that's why I have uh, I have taken a written speech which I will deliver before you and on that you can ask me and I'll speak some experience of mine uh, regarding the tribunals and trials. Dear distinguished participants, experts and ladies and gentlemen, at the outset I take the privilege to extend my heartiest gratitude to the Think Tank, Legal, th legal Think Legal, Think Legal, the organizer of this event for inviting me to say a few words regarding 1973 Act, International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973, and the trials following the formulation of the tribunal. I'm happy to see many lawyers who work in tribunal on behalf of the accused persons, and no one, no prosecutor is here, here today. I shall try to focus on some aspects crucially related to the International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973 and matters involving standard and procedure in prosecuting, trying, and punishing the perpetrators of atrocious acts constituting the offenses as crimes against humanity and genocide as enumerated in the Act of 1973, which was committed in 1971 during our Liberation War. My efforts will be chiefly based on experience that I achieved in dealing with the cases under the Act of 1973 when I had, a, I had to preside over a tribunal 
which was travel number two till September 2015. And in doing so, I shall opt to cite settled jurisprudence as well. The Convention of Prevention of Prevention and Punishment of the Crimes of Genocide, 1948, has defined an international crime and spelled out obligations upon state parties in terms of prosecution. Due to lack of strong political will and absence of favorable regime, as stated by the moderator, the statute of 1973 remained dormant. Eventually, the tribunal was formed on 25th March 2010, the tribunal number one, and the nation saw a glimpse of possibility of trying the perpetrators of these horrendous crimes. Tribunal two was formed in the month of March 2012, in which I presided. Bangladesh considers that the right to remedy should also belong to victims of atrocious crimes. State has an obligation to remedy serious human rights violations Bangladesh recognizes the UDHR Article 8 and ICCPR Article 2, 3, which ensures the right to an effective remedy for the violation of human rights. The offenses of crimes against humanity and genocide are not isolated crimes. These are known as system crimes or group crimes carried out in violation of international humanitarian law and inter international conventions in context of conflict. These offenses provisions in the Statute of 1973, occurred in 1971, during our liberation war. The agenda of Pakistani Occupation Army and their local collaborators belonging to auxiliary forces was to target the determined <coughs> Bangladesh civilians. The Bangladeshi people were subjected to numerous acts of violence and torture. The brunt of the effect, these, effect of these actions were felt by the pro-liberation forces the minority communities, particularly the Hindu community. The purpose of the tribunal was to judiciously scrutinize these crimes, taking into account the context in which they were committed and the widespread impact that they had. The objective was to bring the perpetrators to justice and domestic law, under domestic law. International crimes Crimes are subject to prosecution and punishment irrespective of domestic criminalization of international war crimes. The 1973 Act has simply enacted, in a fashion of recognition, the then existing international rules concerning war crimes and crimes against humanity. The duty of the state to locally prosecute international crimes predates of 1973 Act. Uh, many experts sometimes raise question the retroactivity of the legislation regarding retroactivity of the legislation. We see in the international arena, the ICTY, the International Court for uh, Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, was formed in 1993, two years after the Commission of Crimes, and SCSL, uh, Special Court for Sierra Leone, was formed in 2002, eight years after the Commission of the Concerned Crimes. Therefore, it tends within reason that ICT Act 1973 was enacted within a year and a half of these of of these incidents. It is rather now recognized that even under retrospective legislation, initiation to prosecute crimes against humanity, genocide, and system crimes committed in violation of customary international law is quite permitted. It is to be noted that ICTY, ICTR, ICTR for Rwanda, SCSL, the judicial bodies, statutes was formed many, many years after the commission of the offenses. And so, and so were created retrospectively. Only the ICC is founded on prospective statute. Not only <clears throat> is the retroactive justice process of crimes a widely practiced legal norm, Article 15.2 of ICCPR makes a clear exception to non-retroactivity. Nothing in this article shall, quote, nothing in this article shall prejudice the trial and punishment of any person for any act or omission which at the time when it was committed was criminal, criminal, according, uh, was criminal, co committed was criminal according to the general principles of law recognized by the community of nations. The ICTA 1973 is entirely consistent with ICCPR Article 15 and 2. Because of the statute empowering it, the ICC is rendered incapable of exercising jurisdiction over crimes committed in Bangladesh in 1971 since it was a prospective legislation. This is another reason as to why Bangladesh had to 
despite being a signatory to the Rome Statute, initiate its own process to prosecute and try the crimes committed in 1971. Now, I prefer to move on some much talked about issues. Many organizations, experts raised these issues, particularly when the tribunal started to go ahead with its holy task. In many judgments, we have resolved all these crucial issues. The question is, is to be raised, does delay frustrate prosecution case? While the concept of justice delayed being justice denied is a fairly common principle, considerations of material justice for the victims should prevail when prosecuting crimes of the extreme nature. In such cases, extending a sense of catharsis to a citizenry becomes significantly important. Hence, the idea that there must be a time bar on the pursuit of justice when it comes to matters of such significance is deeply problematic. From the point of morality and sound legal dogma, time bar should not apply to the prosecution of human rights crimes. Neither the Genocide Convention of 1948 nor the Geneva Convention of 1949 contain any provisions on statutory limitations to war crimes and crimes against humanity. Article 1 of the Convention on the non-applicability of statutory limitations to war crimes and crimes against humanity adopted an open for signature, ratification, and ascension by the General Assembly Resolution 2391 on 26 November 1968 provides protection against any statutory limitation in prosecuting crimes against humanity, genocide, etc. Thus, criminal prosecutions are never limited by the time bar. The process of justice cannot be motorized solely by the painful memories and sentiments of the victims. Indeed, it requires strong public and political will, together with favorable and stable political situation. Mere state inaction, for whatever reason, does not render the delayed prosecution readily frustrated and barred by any law. It is also a question, burning question was, still it is in the mind of many people, whether tripartite agreement and immunity of 195 Pakistani war criminals, we have immune them, but why do, why do, we, why, why do we have, why do we have, we have taken the task of trying the local collaborators and others? It is not good enough to say that no individual or member of auxiliary force, as stated in Section 3, 1 of the Act of 1973, can be brought to justice under the Act for the offenses, enumerated therein for the reason that 195 war criminals belonging to Pakistani armed force, forces were allowed to evade justice on the strength of tripartite agreement of 1974. We have recorded our recent finding in many judgments that such an, such an agreement was an executive act, and it does not function as a clog against prosecuting members of auxiliary forces or any individual. As the agreement showing forgiveness or immunity to the persons committing offenses in breach of customary international law was disparaging to existing law, that is the law of 1973 enacted for prosecuting those persons, those offenses. <coughs> Amnesty shown to 195 listed war criminals who were the Pakistani army officer, officials is not cogent with international law. It is to be noted that any agreement and treaty among states in derogation of this principle stands void as per the provisions of international treaty, treaty law convention, Article 53 of Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties, 1969. Thus, any such agreement would exist in conflict with and would be derogatory to just cogents, compelling laws. <coughs> we emphatically reiterated in many verdicts that despite the immunity given to 195 listed war criminals belonging to Pakistan armed forces, on the strength of tripartite agreement of 1974. The Act 1973 still provides jurisdiction to bring them to the process of justice. Provisions as contained in Section 3.1 of the Act 1973 permits the prosecution, trial and sentencing of the barbaric atrocities committed in 1971. Of course, in order to prosecute and try those 195 war criminals belonging to Pakistani army, a unified bold and national effort, effort would be required. Pre-trial arrest and detention, whether we can, we have detained many, <coughs> work, work, many criminals, many perpetrators during our trial, whether it was permitted. 
This question was also raised by many people from many corners. The Act of 1973 does not contain explicit provision in this regard. But if we have a careful look at Section 14.1 of the ICT Act, pre-detention is permitted. In absence of such an interpretation, one would not be able to record confessions as prescribed in Section 11.5 of the Act of 1973. Further, the tribunal by framing rules has prohibited arbitrary arrests or detention of the accused at the pre-trial stage. If it is expedient for the purpose of effective investigation, the investigating agency may, through the prosecution, prosecution seek such arrest or detention by an application before the tribunal, and on being satisfied, the tribunal can render an order detaining the accused. Rule 9 of the uh, Rules of Procedure of Tribunal 2. <coughs> Because at that time, there were two tribunals. Now there is only one tribunal is working. One is dormant. Tribunal, tribunal 2 is dormant now. So on having an isolated reading of section 11.5, there can be no room to say that an accused cannot be detained until and unless he is formally charged by the tribunal. However, some of accused so detained in prison got bail under exceptional circumstances, I recall. Standard procedural fairness. This is also another concern, matter of concern was from, raised from many, many, many quarters. One important concern from the international community is that any trial must be fair to gain credibility. There are three fundamental requirements of such fairness, due process, natural justice, and cardinal principles of procedural fairness. The Act 1973 and rules fairly covers many rights of accused under international human rights law including the right to know the offense charged, the right to trial within reasonable time, the right to fair trial, and public hearing by a competent, independent, and impartial tribunal, which is guaranteed in Article 14.1 of the ICCPR. Further, the presumption of innocence, burden of proof, being promptly informed of the accusation, adequate time, adequate time to prepare a defense assistance of an interpreter, assistance of legal counsel, right to examine witnesses, right as against compelled self-incrimination, etc., are the key rights of the concept of procedural fairness, which have been ensured in Article 147 of the ICCPR. All these rights have been adequately ensured under the International Crimes Tribunals Act 1973, and we will find that those fairly correspond to the ICCPR. In the case of Mujahid, I can recall, re uh, recollect, so far I can recollect. In the case of Mujahid, Mr. Mujahid took time to adduce DWs and we gave him time. My brother, Justice Shahin Islam, is here, he was with me. We gave him time, enough time was given. Ultimately, ultimately he could not produce all the DWs in the court. And Mr. Mir Kashem, this case was tried by my, my tribunal. In that case also, we allowed him sufficient time to bring DWs in his favor. But all the DWs could not be produced before the court. Three or four, you know, they, have the given, they gave the number of eight or nine or six or seven, but they produced only four, three, four, five. In trying the offenses under the general law, the court of our country does not rely on the own standards only. It considers laws from around the world. So even is an, in absence of an explicit provision on this aspect, the tribunal ethically must see what happened in similar situations in other countries, in other courts of the world, and what they have done and take those decisions into account. Besides, the provision that the burden of proving the charge shall lie upon the prosecution adequately implicates the theory of innocence of an accused until proven guilty through trial. Rules 50 of the ICTBD. All possible provisions ensuring adequate rights of defense have been enshrined in the ICTA, ICT Act, and rules of procedure as well. Rules of evidence, section 9 of 1973 is very important for us. We have different, Mr. Uh, Mustafiz Roman said, after 40 years, it was very difficult to get evidences, direct evidences. Uh, uh, that's why in section 19 of the ICT Act, it has been mentioned that we can take provisions of uh, take of the reports, uh, periodicals, and everything, many things. 
prosecuting the perpetrators of crimes against humanity after long 40 years time is a challenge of Bang challenge for bangladesh which may pose obstacles for collecting and organizing evidence but the challenge is not undefeatable there may be few surviving witnesses and although physical evidence may have been destroyed probative evidence is admitted regardless of its format unless the rights of the accused are deemed to be prejudiced by admission here i want to say a few few words we have taken many statements from a newspaper called shongbad shongram shongram used to be published during liberation war there were many news regarding atrocities committed in bangladesh did at that time and from dhonik pakistan and what happened when we want to wanted to bring all the newspapers we found from the public library all has been destroyed very few papers were found we took assistance from those papers evidence may have destroyed probative evidence is admitted regardless of its format unless the rights of the accused are deemed to be prejudiced by admission section 19 provides provision of admitting all reports photographs films and other materials carrying probative value as evidence this provision has been supplemented by rule 44 of the rules of procedure of ictbd all proceedings before the tribunal shall be in public provided that the tribunal deems uh, deems this to be appropriate additionally the tribunal may if it thinks fit take proceedings via a camera uh, i can remember in the case of kader mulla hazrat ali lashkar's daughter ki naam ta chilo i have forgotten the name of the witness a lady she was testified in camera only the lawyers from the prosecution side and the defense side were allowed to stay the, inside the room and the judges no other lawyers were allowed to stay in the room because so bad stories were coming that no one should 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 listen these things that's why we hold this trial this particularly we testified that lady in camera the tribunal ict bd in exercise of its judicial power has tried to take rational steps in conformity of universally recognized standard and norms to uphold the rights of the accused the tribunal even afforded facilities to the accused maintaining the highest standard of compliance with international crimes tribunal act 1973 moreover the accused persons have been permitted to avail medical facilities both in the outside in and outside the jail as and when necessary and sought for the jail authorities have been specifically directed in some cases to provide health friendly vehicles which being moved out of prison all these practices facilitated by the tribunal should establish that the tribunal is quite mindful of the rights well being and speci special needs of the accused tribunal showed no indication of harboring any any kind of bias <coughs> marona subhan was one of the accused now he has been convicted perhaps his appeal is pending before the appellate division he was so ill uh, he needed a friendly vehicle from uh, to bring him from the kashimpur kashimpur prison to the court then court ordered to provide him friendly uh, health friendly vehicle so that he can come quite comfortably in the case of mr akam yusuf we could not conclude the trial because he died in the uh, jail in jail uh, he was provided treatment in the jail by the order of the court tribunal mr abdul alim uh, <clears throat> he was convicted for imprisonment for life till his natural death and he could not stand in his own legs that's why we ordered to provide high commode in the prison cell so the, the tribunal was always uh, considered always mindful to the rights and well being of the accused persons if we look to the last case about we are now what i am to, i am talking about icc if we look to the last case disposed of by icc international C C criminal court what we see Laurent Bagbo the former Ivory Coast president has been acquitted of four counts of charges of crimes against humanity by the ICC on last 15 January 2019 it took 3 years to close the case and the accused Bagbo has been in detention since last 7 years he was in detention for 7 years and it took 3 years time to conclude the trial 
and finally four charge from he was dropped from four charges during last 15 years only three cases have been disposed of by the icc but our tribunal that is ictbd since its inception in march 2010 ensuring all defense rights already disposed of 35 cases till 5th november 2018 since i was there and my friend justice inayat rahim he is here he was he was he was the chairman of icdbd 1 and i was the chairman of icdbd 2 we could complete concluded 21 trials in both tribunals in my tribunal 11 and he concluded 10 10 10 judgment 10 cases before i depart i would like to say that during my time as chairman of the tribunal i have tried to live up to my conscience to the best of my abilities in doing so i am satisfied and stand fervently behind the judgments that my brothers and i have passed the tribunal was not only a judicial forum but stood as a beacon of hope of the nation who for many years could not find closure for the nine months long nightmare <coughs> sorry that is suffered before its emergence this was done not in pursuit of vengeance but in pursuit of catharsis i am pleased that i can place my faith in the tribunal today knowing that it is being led by my brother justice shahin ruslam who i trust to be extremely competent and see as a man of the greatest integrity i hope that the trials soon come to an end finally allowing many families and victims strewn throughout the landscape of this nation to find peace in the fact that those who harmed them and the nation have finally been brought to justice thank you very much for giving me time for the special hearing thank thank you very much justice ubaidul hasan for uh, your lecture today in the course of 20 minutes through your lecture you have touched upon various aspects of the work of the international crimes tribunal and the international crime tribunal act 1973 uh, beginning from the uh, retrospective application of the act how this was justified given that in all other jurisdictions where we have seen international crimes tribunal we have seen that those have also applied the laws retrospectively you have also highlighted upon the challenges that the tribunal faced in order to do its work particularly because it was working 40 years after the event and how the rules of procedure and rules of evidence of the uh, tribunal allowed it to take account of various materials in evidence i am also very happy personally that you sir have mentioned the case of those 195 officers of pakistan army who were repatriated to pakistan under a tripartite agreement between pakistan bangladesh and india in 1974 one of the things that i would like to add over there is that these 195 pakistani army officers who were accused of having committed crimes against humanity they were repatriated upon an understanding that they would be subjected to prosecution to investigation and prosecution if uh, evidence was found in pakistan it is a promise that pakistan has never kept this is something that the younger persons in the audience should remember that in 1974 Pak pakistan basically uh, resorted to a subterfuge in taking back these 195 officers and i'm also very happy that uh, sir has made the point that our court still retains the jurisdiction to bring them to trial and i look forward even if only as a token that our uh, prosecution should make a formal request to the government of pakistan for the particulars of these 195 how many of them are still alive so on and so forth so at least it remains on record that we did our bit in order to try and bring these uh, criminals to justice and uh, uh, 
Uh, and uh, with that, I would now like to invite members of the audience if they have some questions. There are various issues upon which Sir has touched upon, but there are certain others which warrant some discussion. Maybe after the audience uh, 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 has its say, I would also like to, uh, would like to add something to it. Uh, anybody from the audience would like to pose a question? Uh, please introduce yourself and. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am A.K. Rashidul Haq Amit, uh, Advocate Bangladesh Supreme Court, Barrister at Law. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, throughout the whole lecture, I have seen that the accused and the convicted has been given enough uh, opportunity to prove them innocent, and they were given enough medical supports and anything they have ever necessary. But in various forums, uh, especially in international forum, lastly I have seen um, a talk show held in Al Ziva, head to head. Uh, a question was raised that uh, this tribunal is not of international standard. So I'm a bit confused what they meant by international standard and what do you think that uh, is this tribunal is of international standard? Since this question has been raised by the other persons, they can define which is what is international standard. You see, in our high courts and other courts in the lower, lower judiciary, subordinate judiciary, every day we are passing judgments. And these judgments are going to the higher authority, that is the high courts and supreme courts. No one raised this question. No one from any corner of the world raised this question. And we passed the judgment in the tribunal we may be wrong, we may be flawed judgment, may be there. But it has gone to the ultimately appellate division of Bangladesh Supreme Court. They have endorsed, and in some judgments, they have endorsed the conviction, but they reduced the sentence. And in, some, in one judgment, they have endorsed the conviction, and they enhanced the judge, sentence. So since Supreme Court of our country, this is the highest court, apex court of the country, has uh, given the certificate of correctness, so international standard, who the people who uh, say is regarding international standard, ask them to uh, raise question about the other cases ordinary under the ordinary law. They never raise this question. So it's a, should I say I don't know, I am a lawyer, I am a judge. It's absolutely, it's a political, yes, Mr. Mustafiz will say. And yesterday also I saw an interview with Mr. Gahar Rizbi in uh, BB, uh, Oxford, Oxford University there. Uh, he was, I don't know the name of the moderator, Mediasan, Mediasan, famous moderator Mediasan. He also raised this question, uh, just for a, for a second he raised this question. It is the duty of the government to focus throughout the world, the, what happened in the, the tribunal and ultimately what happened in our appellate division and what is the standard we maintained. This is not the judges to, uh, to say that we have done this and that, we have done many things, no. This is the government who can say to the world. Thank you very much. Before I invite uh, the second member of the audience to pose a question, I would like to make a certain observation over here. Uh, those who criticize the work of the International Crimes Tribunal internationally, it is very important that our government should also be capable of responding to it. It is very difficult for judges to speak in their own defense. It's a very peculiar position that judges have, not only the International Crimes Tribunal, but also judges of the Supreme Court. They're the only branch of government which works before the public, and yet they're the only branch of government which cannot speak in its defense in a public forum. They can only speak through their judgments and through their orders. And so it is incumbent upon the government of Bangladesh to speak in defense of what has occurred in Bangladesh. Two things that I would like to point out. First of all, as Sir has very rightly pointed out, the International Crimes Tribunal was not the ultimate court. The ultimate court was the appellate division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. None of the sentences of the International Crimes Tribunal have been executed until and unless they were scrutinized by the appellate division. Yet the criticism in the international forum is solely directed towards the International Crimes Tribunal. The defense should be that, look, the International Crimes Tribunal did not work alone. Each and every judgment of the International Crimes Tribunal has been subjected to scrutiny by the judges of the Honorable Appellate Division. And 
differently constituted benches of the appellate division over a very significant period of time have consistently upheld the work of the International Crimes Tribunal. So if a finger is pointed, the finger will not be pointed only towards the International Crimes Tribunal, it will be pointed towards the entire judiciary of Bangladesh. So, so, so anybody who makes that criticism will then have to direct say that the entire judiciary of Bangladesh is biased. That criticism is not being made. This is one aspect. The other aspect is that those who are pointing fingers at the process of the International Crimes Tribunal are forgetting about the special nature of international crimes and also the fact that a, the doctrine of superior responsibility is applicable over here. Let me just give you an example theoretically. If today in the depths of the forests of Amazon by some miracle of some uh, organic herb, it is found that Adolf Hitler is still alive at the age of 131, yeah. the, because he was born 131. And if a trial is initiated against him, would it be necessary for you to bring evidence to prove that on such and such date he switched on the gas chamber in Auschwitz? No. The mere fact that he was in a position of a superior, a position of superior responsibility of a machinery which was responsible for atrocities should be sufficient. People who have been convicted in the International Crimes Tribunal, it is a matter of record, not on the basis of someone else's evidence, but on the basis of newspapers which were published by them at the time that they were occupying positions of superior responsibility in 1971. So I do not think there should be any level of discomfort at the fact of the people who were convicted. Anybody else? Has a question? Yeah. Actually, this is not, this is Dr. Tariq Iqbal, Associate Professor of Law City University and Advocate Supreme Court of Bangladesh. Actually, just I want to compliment the question has been raised just a few times ago. Uh, there's a dilemma in the legal arena. Sometimes the people think that the International Crimes Tribunal, like 1907, the tribunal has been actually formed. This is the International Tribunal. I, I mean this is the international standard, okay? The question raised the international standard, national standard is a different thing. The aspect is that this is a domestic tribunal. There shouldn't be any sort of ambiguity here. Another thing, there's Professor Mizan of Dhaka University, the professor of law, and he always trying to tell that if they think that does the member of the skin, the, the white skin should be seated here and then they think that this is an international tribunal. So that is not possible in Bangladesh because this country has been, we have got after the liberation year and we, we mean it and we actually uh, mean it very seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks. Would anybody uh, want to ask a question? Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm Tasmiya Nohi Ahmed. I'm an advocate of Bangladesh Supreme Court and also working as a law research officer in Bangladesh Institute of Law and International Affairs. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Actually, I presented a similar paper in uh, University of Mysore at the uh, possibility of fair trial in International Crimes Tribunal. But the question I faced, which I couldn't answer, so I would put the same question before you so that you can clarify me. So, sir, when we are actually uh, trying to justify or trying to explain the trial process being conducted by the International Crimes Tribunal, we have some constitutional provisions which would justify the trials that are being conducted. For example, Article 47 of the Constitution, which says that when there is a crimes against humanity, the general human rights principle would not be applicable. But the question that they have raised, which I could not actually answer, is that, uh, uh, for example, the examples we are bringing in, the uh, crimes tribunal of Yugoslavia or other crimes tribunal which are dealing with the international uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, these are examples of few countries which have applied these laws in this way. So does that justify the way we are doing it here? So if I, I'm not sure if I could put the question properly. You see, this is the, our tribunal is domestic tribunal. Mm -hmm. And the persons who committed atrocities during 1971 are the people of this country. And we have not tried them for their support towards Pakistan. We have tried them for their atrocities they committed in collaboration with the Pakistan army. Mm. So the, we, uh, the, as per ICCPR, it is, a, it is a responsible of the state parties to hold trial initially for their, from their own. And that's why we, uh, the, our government has enacted this law in the year 1973. Mm. And after 40 years, 
uh, tribunal uh, took responsibility to try uh, the offenses. In ICTY I, and, and the Special Tribunal for Rwanda and the Special Court for Sierra Leone, they, uh, they, those courts are hybrid, hybrid courts. The, some judges from their own country and some judges from the international arena, they come, to the, they come, they sit together and they are taking evidence and other things. We have visited, we four, four judges, Justice United Reim, myself and two other judges, we visited uh, Argentina and when we came back, we visited Hague, the ICC, ICTY. Alphonse Orio was the chairman at the time. Uh, we, uh, we observed a we was, um, trial of Mladic, Mladic, uh, Ratko Mladic, he was there. And it is so cumbersome. The witness is speaking in, in one, one language. It is being translated in two or three languages. Judges are from different countries. So that um, they sometimes, they, it is not that they, all the judges understand English. So it, is, it takes long time. So why should we go for hybrid tribunal? Government has decided it's a domestic tribunal. It is a, it is a, a responsible of the state parties, the country itself first. That's why they have taken this resp responsibility, consisting the tribunal. You know, the, initially, this tribunal was supposed to be consisted with the army generals, one a high court judge and army generals. It was amended because Wal may not accept it. Nowadays, the civilians should go there and civilians should conduct the trial. That's why high court division judges sat there and we conducted the trial. So it is not a decent question from the side of the others, the why we have not taken, why the Bangladesh government has not made any hybrid tribunal. It is the government. In its answer, we, the judges, cannot give answer. Perhaps Mustafa clarified this one, sir, again. Thank you. The, po the point that I would like to make is that wherever there is a tribunal to try uh, crimes against humanity, the establishment of tribunal expresses a political will of a particular government, either by, uh, of its own accord or in, under an international instrument to establish a forum to try. But once the forum is established, it works in its own way. So I do not think it is fair to ask why we have not set up a hybrid tribunal, particularly to somebody who has functioned as a judge in that tribunal. That is a question which is to be asked to the government of Bangladesh, number one. The other thing that I would like to say, and I would like to make this observation as a practicing lawyer in Bangladesh now for 21 years. I, I have read judgments not only of Bangladeshi courts, but of judgments of other courts. Some judgments are good, some judgments are bad. But I have not come across another jurisdiction more open-minded than the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and its judges in order to listen to precedent from other jurisdictions. This is a very unique aspect of our Supreme Court of Bangladesh. Here, as a practicing lawyer, we not only cite precedents of our own Supreme Court, but we freely cite precedents from other courts, and our judges do not look upon these precedents in a jingoistic or nationalistic way. When there is an opportunity to learn, they always take it in a very constructive way. You look through the judgments of other countries and see whether they cite jurisdiction judgments from other jurisdiction as readily as we do so anybody else has a question yep sure um thank you justice hassan for your most enlightening uh, lecture i'm tak Huda. i'm a research specialist at bangladesh legal aid and services trust blast um, I have a specific question, and I apologize in advance if it's considered um, very basic because I have very little knowledge about this area. And it's about, um, in the spirit of, as you said, building a, a process of catharsis rather than uh, a vengeance, uh, what about building accountability or providing redress for victims of sexual violence that we've dubbed as Birangon? So on this specific issue, have we victims of sexual violence of 1971 been able to seek justice from the tribunals? And if not, is there any scope within the jurisdiction of the tribunal to do so? And if there is, would this jurisdiction extend to the kind of treatment these victims have faced, not only during the war, but after it? Because I think the state did fundamentally fail not the state, but 
us, the country at large, failed to grant them the same level of recognition that those with those who fought with their foot uh, fought with weapons got. So, would that jurisdiction extend to sort of also allowing them to recount their experiences after the war? And if so, what redress would be available for these victims from the tribunal? Thank you. Tribunals, tribunals two, and trying the case of. Kaiser, Kaiser, Mr. Kaiser, uh, what is his full name? Kaiser, Soed Mohammed Kaiser, Soed Mohammed Kaiser. We found a rape victim and a war baby. Perhaps that is the only only one case. It's a unique case. No one, no, I think the, um, nowhere in the world war baby was examined. In our tribunal, war baby came. We asked, we asked, we just prosecutor was asking, what's your name? He was saying, she said his name, her name. What is your father's name? I don't know. Answer was, just I don't know. Her mother said, I don't know the name, but her father is a Pakistani soldier. After completion of trial, we had, we, we, in our mind, we had something to give reparation, so that whether we can give. But law, the, 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 the way it has drafted, there is no scope to give any reparation. It is a lacuna of the law, certainly. We observe in that judgment that government may take initiative to compensate this type of rape victims and war babies. In the case, uh, possibly in the case of Muzahar, Hassan, Hassan, Azahar, Azahar's case, my friend Mr. Justice Anayatul Rahim, uh, who was the chairman of that tribunal, Tribunal 1, they have observed similarly. And thereafter, when we came back to the High Court Division, my friend, my brother, Justice Shahin Rishnam, and late Justice Anwar Haq, they possibly, they have, you, have, you took a decision, you, they observed that it's a genocidal rape. These are, since these are, these are genocidal rape, so they should be compensated by the government state itself. But if state doesn't come forward, a tribunal cannot do anything. Tribunal can observe and say, you, do, you, you should do that, you should do this and that. That's all. Yes, he has been recognized finally. Uh, ju just uh, uh, ca carrying on from the issue that you have raised, uh, f when it comes to giving reparations to the victims of these crimes, I personally feel that responsibility should be borne by the government which caused it. And again, uh, we have spoken about the 1974 tripartite agreement. Another aspect of the tripartite agreement which remains unrealized is the fact that it was contemplated that there would be a division of assets of the erstwhile state of Pakistan, which would be fair and equitable to recognize the contribution that we, the erstwhile East Pakistan, had to the building of those assets. Again, that was a promise which was not followed through by the government of Pakistan. Any more questions? Okay, I see there are none. So. What remains for me is to, again, uh, bring today's proceedings to a close by, again, thanking Justice Obaidul Hassan for his very valuable lecture. We have already remarked upon the function of war crimes uh, tribunals. It is not only to bring to justice those who are responsible for these atrocities, it is also, also to achieve closure over a traumatic episode in the life of a nation so it can move on. And in that very historical function, not only Obaidul mm -hmm. Hussain's, Oba, Justice Obaidul Hussain, sir, but uh, my Lord Mr. Justice Sanatul Rahim, my Lord Mr. Justice Shahinul Islam, all of you uh, are uh, playing a stellar, all of you have played and are continuing to play a very stellar role for which this nation should forever be in your, debt, in your debt. And uh, I would also like to thank the uh, members of Think Legal for uh, continuing to do their very good work in organizing these sort of uh, programs. In Bangladesh, I think uh, this is a unique endeavor to give an opportunity for new entrants of our profession to fraternize with judges so that they themselves also lose their fear of the court and become much more better lawyers for benefiting from the wisdom that is shared in these platforms. 
And uh, before we end, I would like to invite Anita to give a token of Think Legal's appreciation to Mr. Justice Vadalasan. Why don't uh, Sakib and uh, Anita join me in this stage?